Hey class, this is the third video for week seven, Intro to Philosophy, and in this discussion, we're gonna take up David Hume's problem of induction. So we're following the argument that takes place between um, sections three through five in um, Enquiry Concerning Human Understanding, Hume's major work from 1748. And what exactly is the problem of induction? So this is gonna be a pretty fast um, a general overview, although I'm going to, to turn to the text to engage with that directly. Um, but what is this problem of induction? Um, well, essentially the problem of induction is a problem regarding the possibility of what philosophers call apodictic certainty in the sciences. So what is known apodictically is known um, absolutely with unshakable confidence. That is, in um, an apodictically shown truth, a demonstration has occurred where the conclusion reached is uh, shown to be necessary, right? So we find this concept of necessity. And so remember for Descartes, uh, one of the last metaphysicians we engaged with, knowledge means certainty. In other words, apodicticity, that which cannot be doubted. Um, and Hume wants to know, is it possible to achieve legitimate scientific understanding and knowledge of the world that meets um, that perhaps to some impossible criterion? Um, in other words, absolute unshakable certainty. Um, and Hume comes to a radically profoundly skeptical conclusion on this matter, even as a champion of science, of what we call the scientific method, uh, a, a reducibly simple version of which is of course problem uh, the cycle or process of problem hypothesis testing and that's what hume means when he talks in our reading about uh experimental philosophy um, and experiment which means experience so in a laboratory setting a scientist carries out a particular experiment using a given apparatus uh, in order to grapple with a particular problem for which a hypothesis is made. Um, and through this experiment, which relies upon sense experience, data is assimilated, and then one can do all sorts of things with this uh, data. One can build theoretical models um, to parse the information, to get rid of the extraneous noise, and to determine that which is legitimately causal in its association, and not merely uh, coincidentally correlative, right? So it's really from Hume that we get this famous distinction between causation and correlation. Now, this epistemological framework wherein knowledge as such, legitimate knowledge can only be absolutely certain knowledge, was a byproduct of earlier modes of intellectual discourse found in, for instance, theology and within philosophy proper, metaphysics. Uh, and so science, as it was really getting underway, modern science as we know it in the 17th century, had to take over these epistemological categories uh, from the pre-existing sciences of theology and metaphysics, which means, as Descartes did, even as he was attempting um, through his conceit to dismantle, to dismantle Aristotelian metaphysics, uh, he had to take over this category of necessity. So from the purview of Aristotelian metaphysics, God is the being that can be known with absolute certainty as the only necessary being in the cosmos. Right? So from Descartes' point of view, although I as an existing being am not necessary in my existence because I would not exist if it weren't for my parents and for their part, they wouldn't be here without their parents, and this goes down this um, perhaps interminable historical chain, it terminates uh, from the Aristotelian point of view at God, right, as the only necessary being in the cosmos. Uh, so Hume now at the beginnings here, uh, more or less, so a century or so after modern science has gotten underway, wants to determine how certain scientific evidence and conclusions can make us about the phenomena that we're trying to understand in the world. Uh, and so um, when he says we can't achieve absolute certainty about matters of cause and effect, which it's in the purview of science to disclose and characterize for us in illuminating ways, 
That doesn't mean that he wants us to turn rather to the broad um, sweeping absolute accounts of reality that we find in metaphysics or theology. So for example, on page nine on our reading, uh, he writes, so when we come to suspect that a philosophical term is being used without any meaning or idea, we need only to ask, from what impression is that supposed idea derived? If none can be pointed out, that will confirm our suspicion that the term is meaningless, i.e. has no associated idea. In other words, if you suspect that someone is presenting you with a load of bullshit, consider, could the idea articulated, in principle at least, be traced back to some original sense impression in one's experience? If the answer is no, well, then you are, in fact, dealing with bullshit. Um, so we're stuck between um, legitimate knowledge, truths that we come by through tremendous um, incremental difficulty in the processes of science um, that can't guarantee us certainty, or these sweeping generalizations which have no basis in material reality, such as, for example, uh, connecting us to the last lecture in this series, um, Barclay's idea that we must all be ideas existing in some divine consciousness. Hume, as I mentioned before, asks, where do we derive this idea of God's consciousness or of God at all? Uh, it could be bullshit. We've, we have no sensory impression of God. And in fact, given that God, the very concept, refers to an immaterial um, that is spiritual being, which our souls as immaterial, supposed to be in a kind of um, substantial affinity, uh, then God is no one that we can even, in principle, come to know or experience by way of any of our five senses. So it must be bullshit. Um, so hold on to the fundamental concepts that we've already, in our previous stay with um, Hume, from the last unit of the course, of impressions and ideas. So everything we know, and this is Hume's empiricism, everything we know is ultimately traced back to some original sense impression, either in the outward form of a perception or in the inward form of a sentiment or a feeling or an emotion. Um, and so any knowledge that we have, and our knowledge is built up through ideas, which we put in association with one another in various ways, all knowledge is, is made up of ideas, and those ideas, again, have to be traceable, at least in principle, to some legitimate material experience of the world through one or more of our five sense modalities. Uh, so um, let's walk through the problem, the steps uh, that we get through this problem of induction. So I set up briefly in the end of the last lecture, um, Hume's so-called fork. Uh, which says all knowledge is either of relations of ideas, which are abstract and theoretical, not um, immediately grounded in sense experience, but um, they capture and delineate the processes through which we take the ideas, which did issue through sense experience, and put them into various associations with one another. And we do that principally through mathematics, uh, like two plus two equals four. Um, that is apodictically certain. It cannot be denied, and it's true now, here, anywhere, and at any time. Um, also, the truths of deductive logic. So uh, the principle of non-contradiction says it's impossible to think um, A and not A. So it's impossible to even conceive of what it would be like, for example, for me to say I am standing and I am not standing at the same time. Right, so that's a logical proposition or truth, which we can rely on with unshakable certainty. And then also conceptual definitions, uh, like in Hume's fork, um, all bachelors are unmarried men. That's a conceptual definition, which means the subject and its connection to the predicate. So the subject bachelor and its relation to the predicate unmarried men. Um, <clears throat> the predicate is just an opening up or an unpacking of what's already articulated in the subject itself. The subject just means the predicate, right? And so um, you don't have to go out in the world and interview unmarried males to figure out whether they are bachelors because they are so by definition. Um, so what 
is this problem of induction. We can only be certain, it seems, of that which presents itself immediately to our sense experience. Um, So on page 12, this is the major problem. I want to use an example to characterize and um, detail for us to clarify. Uh, this is page 12. He says, what sorts of grounds do we have for being sure of matters of fact, propositions about what exists and what is the case that aren't attested by our present senses or the record of our memory? Um, so um, imagine, there is a fire, you see a few blocks blazing down the street, you immediately intuit without having um, experienced the feeling of the warmth of the fire because you're not close enough. Uh, you immediately intuit that if you were to go into that fire, which of course no one would recommend, it would burn you and be radically unpleasant, right? So um, how do you know that? You don't presently have an impression of the heat, but just perceiving visually the flame, you infer that there would be heat if you were to touch it. How do you do that? Well, uh, the next paragraph, all reasonings about matter of fact seem to be based on the relation of cause and effect, which is the only relation that can take us beyond the evidence of our memory and our senses. So you see the flame and you interpret that immediately as the cause of a potential effect of heat. Um, and when we say there's a causal relationship between flame and heat, we typically mean that there is a necessary connection between flame and heat, such that if there is heat, there must be something like a flame, which pre previously existed as its grounding cause. Um, so we move from uh, an inference based on a present impression of something of which we do not have an immediate present impression to the relationship of cause and effect. Uh, and the next, uh, on still on page 12, he says, so if we want to understand the basis of our confident confidence about matters of fact, we must find out how we come to know about cause and effect. Um, so we have to know about cause and effect. Okay, so how do we know about cause and effect? How do we know without touching this fire we perceive down the street from us that it would burn us if we were to touch it? Uh, well, we determine the causal relationship between heat and flame here because of our past experience, because we have experienced the association of heat and flame. Uh, so for example, if you can see my scar at one year old, I crawled into the kitchen, opened the broiler because my parents were distracted by the news of John Lennon's murder. Uh, and I put my hands there, burned the shit out of myself uh, and um, you know, from that moment on, I was, of course, quite wary of flames, so I knew to avoid them. Um, but Hume's point is, if I had never experienced the effects of fire before, I would have no basis on which to infer that causal connection. Um, so how do I know it? Well, because of habit, my habituated responses, and this is what it means by convention in the world, because all previous fires I've experienced have been hot, I infer that fires in the future will be hot as well. Um, but how do I know that that's true? Um, I know that that's true because I have this kind of feeling which tells me on the basis of my experience that the future tends to resemble the past. But as Bertrand Russell puts it, just because past futures have tended to resemble past pasts, does not necessarily follow that future futures will resemble future pasts. 